And that to me is why we're doing this, not because I like to overwork myself <laughs> for free, but because right now, if they go down, we all go down and they are going down. We're seeing it happen in Italy where they, it, it, they're just like all these frontline people are walking into their own death sentence. For this episode, I sat down with performance artist, comedian, writer, and elected representative Christina Wong. As the coronavirus started taking hold in California, Christina abruptly had to postpone her show Christina Wong for Public Office and has since devoted her time to sewing masks for nurses and other frontline workers. I asked her what prompted her to roll up her sleeves and how people can transition from feeling helpless to feeling empowered. Christina also sheds light on what it's like to reinvent yourself as an artist during difficult times like these. Hi, Christina. I know things are more than hectic for you right now, so I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You are an LA-based artist and comedian, now turned master mask maker within just the last couple of weeks. I have aged 200 years in the last two weeks or whatever. (laughs) Who thought that sitting around at home could age you so quickly? It just seems like every morning I wake up and I think to myself, is this all a dream or is this really reality, the reality that we're living in? And it is a reality. It's quite scary. Yeah. I've heard some funny things. Like I didn't know that the end of the world would involve this much paperwork. (laughs) (laughs) So how did, did you start sewing masks for people during this pandemic when that is typically not what you do on a daily basis? Yeah, um, exactly. Let's say it's Sunday. I started, I think, making masks Friday or Saturday. So I'm like eight or nine days in. I've never sewn a mask. Never really thought about what materials go into making a mask. Um, But I do use a sewing machine. I have one of the three sewing machines I've not broken uh, still in my house, which is a Hello Kitty sewing machine. I, I use a sewing machine to sew my sets for my solo shows, which I tour. And I sew my props. I usually sew them out of felt, which doesn't need to be seamed. Um, And uh, basically, I had an entire tour of my show, Christina Wong for Public Office, canceled. Um, I was literally at a community college in Sacramento performing at 12 in the afternoon, not even sure if the show was going to go on that morning because some of the classes had already gone online. And 20 minutes before the end of the show, everyone in the audience got like an alert that the campus was closing. So as I drove back, it was just like, just alert, alert, alert. Tom Hanks has it. Everyone has it. This, ha- this is happening. This spike, that spike. And there's nothing worse than listening to terrible information as you're doing the, the drive on the five, I think. I think that's like the worst, most crazy making thing. And I was with my director and we're just like, wow, what's the future of theater? What's the future of our careers? Uh, How am I going to make an income? And so I just sort of was sitting around in uh, the first few days of the quarantine, watching all the scary movies and lying around in bed. And then my friend sent me an article saying that hospitals needed face masks and there, here's a pattern you can use. And I was like, oh, I've been wondering if I should just sew one of these because you can't find a face mask anywhere. And they're not as effective as an N95, which is the coveted uh, mask, um, which now doctors and nurses are having to reuse. So I started to follow a pattern online, found some scraps of fabric. And now eight days later, I have a, a virtual factory all over the city. Uh, with with some like sister stations in San, in San Francisco and a few people in Florida who have mailed stuff to and we're the anti-sewing squad. I have thousands of dollars in donations and I feel like Daddy Warbucks, like just paying for elastic and fabric for all these other sewing groups. And yeah, so that's this weird version of the American dream where you start from nothing and without even trying, you have a sweatshop with children working it. So that's, <laughs> this is, this is both like this blessing and a complete nightmare that I live in right now, which is like, I, I, I find myself going through all these emotions of like feeling so powerful, so purposeful, and then feeling so completely angry at uh, our, our health system, at our government for not being prepared for this, at people for wanting masks, thinking that I'm a human factory when really these are masks that are made in factories, not by, you know, women mostly who are sewing these out of the love and generosity of their heart. But yeah, it's been a, 
it's been an interesting ride. And at this rate, I'm like, I don't, I might, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it is, it, it has really grown exponentially every day, much like this virus. Yeah. I'm sure you had no idea once you, la- when you launched into this, that it would turn out the way it is now and grow so quickly. And no, I just figured I, I was just just right. like 20 a day. I was putting it out there. You want me to send you some, just PayPal me for, for, for postage, you know, it was just sort of, and then suddenly nurses were writing me saying, Oh God, can you, we, we don't, we don't have any PPE. We're, I'm afraid I'm going to die. It's like, you don't say no to that. So I go, okay. And I'm like, how am I going to make 50 masks at the rate that I'm doing when more requests are coming in? Then I was on a spec a story on spectrum, and a few things I posted went super viral and people are like, also oh, just like sick people are messaging me, like asking for it. So you can't say no, but it's also just really scary trying to figure out who do I send it to first? You know, I can only produce so many a day out of my Hello Kitty sewing machine. And so I'm like, you know, do I send it to this nurse or this doctor? It's so crazy. Yeah, that's a very tough decision for you to have to make. Yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible decision. And, and, and we live in a country where I shouldn't have to be making those decisions. Certainly not. So how did you mobilize other people to help you? I think, I, think I hit my breaking point and was like, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. And if it just started with my neighbor a few blocks away, I was having them cut for me. Um, so they didn't have to both cut and sew. And that was really helpful and then I think their hands were hurting and they were like, I found another person for your sweatshop. I, I found myself um, just so overwhelmed and, and people were like, just ask for help. And so my job in the last few days has switched from sewing to managing. I haven't touched my sewing machine at all today. It's, it's just, I've been just managing all these drop-offs of fabric, elastic, uh, directing people on what pattern to use, um, taking finished masks. Uh, and I did one drop off with a nurse, um, who is here in LA, who was like tears in her eyes. Uh, we gave about 34 masks for her unit and she was just so emotional and so excited. And I'm just really happy that we could help her. And, and that to me is why we're doing this. Not because I like to overwork myself (laughs) for free, but because right now, if they go down, we all go down and they are going down. And, and we're seeing it happen in Italy where they, it, it, they're just like all these frontline people are walking into their own death sentence. I don't even know what to say. It's just so it's, 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 I, I finally, for the first time in my life, I think, feel like I actually, like, I like to say as an artist, oh, I save people's lives. I give them sort of an emotional truth and that's what life is. But I actually have one skill that will make a huge difference for the people who can use it. And that is to make two pieces of fabric stick together. So, you know, for me, I feel like I have no choice but to deploy it. I cannot sit back and go, oh, I'm not being paid or, oh, someone else will do it or the N95s will come. Like, no, this is to me the most patriotic thing I can think to do, which is to kind of rise up, stand up for the health of our country and make these and coordinate people to make them. How can people feel more empowered to do something during this time? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who want to help, but they are stuck at home, obviously, and they don't really know where to start. If Okay, so so there are people who don't sew. That's fine. We can use people who are, um, and I'm not, the, I'm not the only sewing factory in LA. There are other teams. My friend Lauren Opelt is running the, the Mask Crusaders, and they are really good. They, they, they just sent a thousand masks to Louisiana, and they are um, costume guild people. So out of work theater folks and people who, who really know to sew and are used to working in teams and they're churning out hardcore hospital orders. Like what I'm doing is so Mickey Mouse compared to what they do. And, uh, and, and for the people that can't sew on their team, they get them to cut fabric. If they can't sew or cut, they get them to help acquire fabric or help drive around and pick things up and drop things off in a safe way, of course. So that's, that's a lot of what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. And, and people I get, I feel want to do stuff. And I think the most helpful thing to do, and I had to kind of be passive aggressive and post this on my wall today, is because too many people were like, hey, Christina, you should reach out. You should, you should do this. You should talk to us. And it's like, no, no, I need you to help me do the thing I should be doing because right now I have plenty of stuff to do. I'm not looking for more work to do. Um, I'm actually looking for people to help me do this work. 
So before you suggest to the people who are doing things, things they should add to their already full plates. So they have, you know, cause you don't, if you don't want them to have a nervous breakdown and not be able to do anything at all, think, okay, how can I help them reach out? How can, how can I help them do some research? Like, for example, like hundreds of people were tagging me in this post that Joanne's Fabric was giving out free masks. And it was so frustrating because it was only two yards of fabric. There's no Joanne's that's open near me, not even for curbside drop off. So it was just like wasting my time to continually like tell me to look at it or tell me to go ask if they had more. What you should do is call and ask for me and see what their deal is and if they can give more. Like, help us find stuff. Like you have skills, maybe you're a producer, maybe you're good at organizing and ask like these, these are things I can do, but how can I help? You know, that just offering yourself up that way. But um, standing on the sidelines and shouting out more things to do is the worst thing you can do for people's mental health right now who are really trying, they're working from end to end to make it happen. What are some of the materials that are currently needed and where could people find them even within their homes? So the world of mask making, we I'm, I know I'm eight days in, but I'm kind of an expert. But, you know, it's like I've read all the articles. There's a lot of conflicting information out there. There are articles that say wear a mask no matter what. And then there's this one article going around saying that cloth masks can make you more sick. And I've been sent it several times and stop sending it to me. It's not helpful take it up with the hospitals that are telling us to sew masks. Stop showing me this, you know? But with that in mind, it's usually 100% tightly woven cotton. And some of these masks are built with pockets. So you could put like a coffee filter, I've heard, um, an ear filter. Now, none of these compare to an N95 or just staying at home. I want to say that. So because <laughs> like I started to have to write notes to go in these mask letters because I don't want people who aren't informed to think they're suddenly invincible if they put a mask out on and run outside. So it's cotton, um, the grocery store bag material that, that, uh, that's not been waterproof, the reasonable grocery store bags. It's sort of, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but that's, that material can actually be used and be very useful. Uh, Jersey is another. So people are cutting up their old t-shirts um, to be mm-hmm. thrown into masks. And it's, it's kind of an, it's like, it's amazing that everyone has these resources in their home, but it is also completely sad that it has come to the point that we are actually asking people to go into their drawers, empty their craft drawers, empty their t-shirt drawer and start cutting so that our doctors don't die. And we've actually, one of the hacks we figured out because a lot of the nurses were complaining about the elastic masks. Some, some people, some of the doctors like the elastic because they can get it on easy and some hate it because it, and so this is what's so difficult for us to figure out is there's no clear, perfect answer. There are some hospitals that straight up say, this is the pattern we want you to use but some don't care and just write me personally. And they just say, please 30 masks, you know, <laughs> they just, they just don't want to wear a bandana around their face. So, so anyway, so we, we started to try to figure out how to do this tie thing. And it's not a fast process because this, so, to make a tie out of fabric, you got to cut a long strip. You have to iron it flat. Then you have to stitch it down. It's kind of a lot of work. So we were looking at these lanyards that everyone hoards because we go to conferences and stuff like that. And we've been cutting those and sewing them into our masks. So literally, like, you're going to look at a doctor and <laughs> the mask around their head might say, like, Ohio, Ohio Playwrights Conference on the side of it or something, you know, because <laughs> they're wearing upcycled masks. It's, like, so ridiculous. Yeah, that's very creative. So creative. I look at my lanyards. I, yeah, I would never think that they would ever come to good use again. But clearly that is one. I've seen a lot of comparisons in the recent days of people creating masks now and Rosie the Riveter. Yeah, no, I really feel like, I think that's what really had me like going in the first few days is I felt like I've never felt like a soldier like this in my life. And I feel like I am the, I'm literally arming the soldiers for war. And I don't know how to shoot guns. I don't know how to, I'm not a fan of war, honestly. And, (laughs) and I, I think that's what this real feeling of patriotism has come from is the sense that I'm like, I'm fighting for America's health. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting to protect Americans I've never met, but I, you know, it, it really comes from this, this deep 
love not just nationally but for our, our planet and now i'm just like oh i get that pride i get the pride of like i'm gonna make this with my bare hands and help you and yeah i do feel a real sense of pride and every time one of my volunteers shows me masks that they've made i'm just like we're doing it one mask out of like the 50 million that are needed at a time <laughs> I saw that LA uh, started essentially like crowdsourcing the protective gear that they want to have, the 5 million of them that they want to make in the 5 million non-medical masks in the next few weeks. So if there's any listener out there that is in Los Angeles, whether you need protective gear or you're ready to produce, you can also directly go onto laprotects.org and sign up whether you are ready to produce or you need more protective gear. So it turns out that you and I were both in the same theater club at UCLA, uh, except that I came long after you. Thank you. Thank you, young <laughs> what <gen> blood. <laughs> <laughs> what generation were you? Two? Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, G20, so. I, I could yeah. be your illegal mom. I guess so. <laughs> the joke used um, to be when I was on tour, I was like, I could be your big sister. All right, now I'm old enough to be your mother. <laughs> your legit young mom. So what does this pandemic mean for you as an artist? So I'm a live artist and I rely on crowds. And my new show that I was touring and will hopefully tour when this is over acts as a rally. And right now I think people, uh, well, one, we're not allowed to gather in groups, but I think we're going to be scared to gather in groups. I'm hoping what happens is that there is a renaissance around live performance and action because zoom does not cut it these shows on zoom don't cut it and i really hate it when people say you can just do your shows on zoom and i'm like i don't that's not how i work <laughs> i i mean if if i could have done if i could do shows on zoom now i would have just been doing film all those times instead of making you come to a live show you know and i think there's something really valuable about being able to see a performer and have them see you in the eye look you in the eye and i think in all these drop offs and stuff that are happening people all these volunteers are coming by dropping off fabric and there's such brief interactions but it's kind of amazing and powerful it's like <laughs> we're literally throwing fabric into each other's cars and then running away and blowing kisses without touching our mouths and um but there's something kind of about this human connection as rushed and hurried as it is right now that is kind of keeping me sane and reminding me that I'm still a performer. And this is why I perform for crowds that I can see is because of this connection. So it's funny because we were, we were living in a world and I was getting really cynical about audiences of your generation and just younger audiences, because a lot of them would be like, Oh, just put it on YouTube. Oh, is it going to be broadcast later? And it's like, you know, that's, no, you don't know. You don't realize that's not the same thing. And I thought that people would actually adapt to this better because aren't you looking at screens all day anyway? And so like, what's the difference between that and that and getting to go drive and eat Thai food and then come home, you know? So yeah, I think as a live performer, I definitely think it's going to, there's going to be a whole new body of theater that addresses this. But also I think it's going to, hopefully ignite a renaissance in live work, if not at first a panic about gathering again. So you think that even once the shelter in place orders start going away, whether that's in a few weeks or in a couple of months that after that, and there may be a permanent damage in a sense to how we gather. We're good at never learning from our mistakes. So <laughs> maybe we'll, people will be worried for the first few weeks and then forget whatever it is. But for me, I'm thinking, well, someone could be dormantly carrying it somewhere and then we're all hanging out again and, you know, <laughs> and an infection shows up. So, and, and, and if not this, as long as we, this is becomes another political point, but as long as we continue to eat animals the way we do uh, and raise them covered in their own shit from birth to slaughter, these kind of flus and diseases are going to continue happening because they start in the animals and then they end up in our either our lives or food or our own bloodstream, whatever. So this could unfortunately happen again. Yeah, you bring up a good point that a lot of it is due to the fact that we consume so much meat. And earlier, you also said that we don't really learn from our mistakes. So do you think that as we have this experience that's going to last several months, that we will see changes in the greater spectrum of things as to, to minimize the outbreak of epidemics in the future? I hope government would be more prepared 
about to handle this and go, well, maybe we should keep more N95 stocked, or maybe we should have a plan in place for when uh, a pandemic happens again and, and, and figure out where we're going to put all the homeless people and how everyone's going to get fed and, you know, <laughs> what we're going to do if we, if the guy at the very top is saying very confusing things, like how do we take charge of our own jurisdictions to keep everybody safe and to make sure the message is clear? Do we close beaches and public parks and schools like right away? So I'm hoping at least because it would have to start there a bit. But I, I think this is helping us all maybe learn how completely fragile our systems are. And for a lot of us who missed the virus lesson in science class, I think it's finally helping people understand, oh, you don't have to be sick as hell to spread a virus. That was like what was driving me crazy was that a lot of people were like, oh, I've been on the subway a bunch. I don't have it. And it's like, you do. You probably do. You just have no symptoms. Yeah. When you look at other viruses that have been out there and other epidemics like Ebola, which is far more deadly than this coronavirus is, um, it doesn't spread as easily. But I mean, there are worse, worse viruses that can come in the next few years and can pose a whole new threat to to humanity. Do you think this period in time will serve as a source of inspiration for a lot of artists out there and that in the over the next few years we'll see a lot of movies a lot of shows a lot of books the first week i was like oh no i don't want to watch any solo shows themed around coronavirus and yet already in my head i have a feeling this this little two week or however long this lasts of me running a sweatshop in la is completely a show playing out like it is <laughs> it is ridiculous and it's 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 not just about like Oh, poor Christina. It's about the American healthcare system and it's come to this. Again, we don't know how long this is going to last and how long gigs are going to be canceled. So what does that mean for you and for others like you? Well, uh, yeah, I, don't, I know it's, it's really a tricky time right now to be in theater because I don't even know if the, some of those small theaters will be able to sustain. Like they, All my shows were not so much canceled, but postponed, but it's sort of like postponed to when? Because they probably had artists that were also going to bring in the fall. And now you're not going to program five, like five times the artists that, <laughs> that you didn't schedule before. Like some of those, you know, you just don't either schedule artists in the future and you bring the old artists in or, you know, some other situation. So, so it's definitely a huge loss of revenue and work for a lot of us. It's, it's financially devastating for, for our audiences, you know, who won't have the money to come buy tickets or support our companies or, or whatever. It, it is a scary reality of like, what if there's that one thing? Cause they always say the show will go on, but not in this case, this is, this is not that situation. It makes, it does make for a very fascinating context for, for drama. And it, it will be interesting to see what kind of plays come out of here. But, oh, that's, I think what I was saying. It was like when the first week of this, I said, oh God, I don't want to watch a bunch of coronavirus themed plays, but here I am. I'm going to be writing a play about me being a sweatshop. And, <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, I am my own cliche. I am my own cliche. But it's like, this is such a weird time of self-reflection and understanding who we are without the proximity to other humans and stuff like that. It's like, it, it's so ripe for, for drama. I just don't know if anyone will want to see it again because not not everyone was thrilled to watch like a 9-11 themed play or movie after that happened. Very true. Very true. Do you get enough sleep at night? Yeah, sort of? I, 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 I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night. I'm like, why? Why? But it's more like six to seven. And then I sort of lie around for the first few hours. But are you getting enough sleep? Uh, I am because thankfully I get to work remotely from home and... We we're pretty much on a on a schedule. So, where do you work? Team. Disney. I'm part of their global crisis management team. Is this the crisis that you're managing? This this is the crisis. <laughs> Did you just yeah. get hired, or was I it mean, right before all this? No, it was before. They're getting their money's yeah. worth out of you, then. <laughs> yeah, our emergency operations center has been activated since January. So, the good thing is that countries in in Asia are doing much better, like China, and so our offices there are coming back up, and that's been giving us hope. 
But earlier you talked about, you know, waves and not wanting to let people go out again because there might be that second wave. And I remember my parents, like a couple of weeks before all this happened, asking me not to come visit them in San Francisco, which I was going to after my Santa Cruz show, which was canceled because they were like, oh, you're going to hug your audience members and then come visit us and then we're going to die. And I was like, what? They're being crazy. But in a way, they, for the first time, I will say they were not being crazy. You know, and so I think older people for sure feel very vulnerable to crowds and stuff. And I think, and that they make up a lot of the regional theater audience. So it's going to be interesting to see how much they come. I think younger people will be like, yeah, we're free. We're out. Now we can fuck, you know, but (laughs) older people, I don't know. So if you had one call to action for listeners, what would it be? Well, one, take care of yourself. I know I'm doing a terrible job at that. But beyond that, if you find yourself being bored and looking for something to do, to do, to to look at who are doing things and, and rather than put things on their plate, ask, you know, if you're excited by what they're doing, hey, is there a way it can help you? And think about what skills you have. Even if it's a little thing, like just picking things up and dropping it off. And if you're able to do that, that's that's so huge right now. And I feel so grateful for everyone who's volunteering. And when I see some of these other sewing teams that come by to pick up stuff for me, I know that they, just those folks who are just driving, you can see that they feel so, they've been given purpose in being of support. And this is the time to do it sooner than later. And if, if not that, think of just how can you support other people? For me, that's been this whole thing. Like I was, I've been trying to help homeless people and like, I have no income right now and I'm, I'm helping all these other people because I want to, I refuse to believe I'm completely powerless in this situation because I am not. And so you're in the same boat as everybody else, but believe me, you have some, you have some power, you have some privilege and there are other people who benefit from your kindness. So I guess I leave you with that. Thank you, Christina. I hope this was useful. This really was. And uh, I'm so glad that you're out there and that you're helping out communities in all ways, shapes and forms. Um, It's really inspiring. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, I got to go back to running my sweatshop. (laughs) Well, thank you, Christina. Thank you. Best of luck to you. Yeah, I hope to meet you in person one day when we can uh, actually meet closer than six feet. All right. Bye, Lorraine. Thank you. I'd like to close off this episode by thanking all artists out there whose performance, music, and craft is helping us get through these hard times. You can learn more about Christina Wong and her work at christinawong.com. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, I'd be grateful if you shared it with a friend or gave the podcast a review. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to it on all major podcasting platforms. Thank you, and until next time, I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider.